<laughs> and we are live. <laughs> hey, how's everybody doing? <laughs> Thanks for uh, stopping by. Obviously, uh, Tarek is here. He is uh, visiting and uh, working on some design stuff this week. We haven't had as many uh, in-person visits over the last year and a half for obvious uh, illness reasons. Um, I am totally going to move this camera so that Tarek is not off to the side. Um, oh, yeah, I'm so wide that I can't fit in frame. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, at least we're sitting, so my six-inch height difference doesn't show. I like, hey, stop, 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 <laughs> right. None of that. None of that. I have to, otherwise my bag is going to give out. Yeah, we've been, uh, but we've been here, uh, Tarek's been here all week. We've been working on a number of different projects and designs. There's just a time when you we're collaborating on things, or he's, usually he's working on a design and sharing with me where we have to kind of get together in person to work on things. So, yeah, we thought today we would take questions on uh, design process, collaboration, anything on the shop. But probably the best questions to ask are, are questions that are great for Tark to answer since he's here. Yeah, <laughs> let's... Uh... Uh, we did, let's see, we took questions online on Instagram and on uh, YouTube. So we're, yeah. we'll probably start with some of those and then go to live questions as well. Yeah, certainly. Uh, so, you should be able to hear me. I think I'm a little bit loud, so give me just a sec. Um, and, and hopefully no blue screen of death today, because... Uh, well, I've, I've fixed fun. my computer. That was a Anything problem. On the shop? Oh, but probably the best question is to ask. Hey, uh, so, <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying so to... So we do have sound. Someone said no sound, but I think that was uh, yeah, whoever a said, little bit delayed. Whoever said no sound, I'm hearing sound on our end, so hopefully. Um, so, let's see. Uh, we've got new upcoming products and designs. Uh, someone asked if there was any uh, update on the uh, Dart Zone, or rather Adventure Force uh, Spectrum, any mod parts for that? Yes, yeah, so we've got stuff printed. Um, I'm, I'm way behind the ball on Spectrum stuff. And actually, maybe Tarek will get involved on some of that. But he's had yeah. some larger projects sucking up a lot of time. Um, but we'll, we'll definitely get to it, because I think the Spectrum is, is our path forward as a hobby. Uh, obviously, we're all anxious to see what happens with the uh, Dart Zone Pro Mark III. Right, right. Two weeks or so, I think. Two weeks. I am, yeah. I Maybe can't, cannot wait because yeah. they haven't disappointed us yet. Uh, do you have any plans to mod rival blasters to shoot hyper rounds? Uh, and is mm. there a proton pack for <laughs> hyper in the works? Um, I guess that's kind of a question for me. Uh, so. Well, I've seen people like Drac just toss hyper rounds into rival blasters. I really wouldn't recommend it. The squishy, the balls are squishy enough and small enough that they can get wedged between your flywheels and the cage, especially in the stock configuration of basically all of these blasters. There's enough room for that to happen. You're pretty much guaranteeing you're going to have a problem. Um, the spacing as it is now on those cages is not right for hyper. So I think you're really going to have to make a, it's, it has to be a custom cage a replacement to make a rival blaster shoot hyper. And then really those blasters, the feed system's not going to work that well. Um, I think the Percy's could probably be adapted with the right amount of spacers to make the, the feed track um, where you've got the belt feeding to make to fix that tolerance so it, it actually feeds the rounds all right because the Mach 100 and the, and the Percy's pretty much have the same feed mechanism. They're just, it's just shrunken down on the Mach 100. So, Long story short, it's probably doable, but it's going to be a lot of work. It's going to be cage wheels full replacement, more than likely. Mm, and the wheels. Well, uh, we could go with micro wheels, like you know, like the worker wheels or printed ones. I've been testing, and it's not been working out as well as I was hoping to. Because yeah. uh, I was testing a rival cage, and then we went to a hyper cage, and it none of this stuff works out. So it is pretty much a pure new cage. You can't just shrink a rival down and hope it works out. Yeah. Yeah, the, it's not not totally ideal. I'm just doing a little little tiny reframe here. Yeah, um, I have to be careful what I say for future projects. But <laughs> um, even custom wheels would have to be designed quite differently. And we don't know yet. Oh, thank you. We don't know yet if, if you want to grip the ball completely or not. So do you do flat wheels or do you do concave wheels to cover it? So that's still something that we've been testing out. So. Yeah, so we're playing with it. And then as far as Proton Pack, um, those balls are jam central, and I thought the auger isn't the problem, so the feed mechanism I have can be scaled down, and that is going to work. But airflow through the tube, they're both heavier, denser, and stickier. Um, they don't really want to go through tubes as well as rival balls do. So 
I'm not super thrilled with how that that's going, um, but I would like to do a proton pack for sure. Uh, I think it's going to take a custom blaster though, because the Mach 100 is a little disappointing overall. I mean, if you fix the feed issues and the accuracy issues, it would be better. Um, for those that watched the review, we amended that to a three star. I think it's not a very, it's not a, it's not as good of a blaster as I was hoping. And the, the more I work with it and the more I upgrade it, I pretty much burnt mine out on 3S. So it's not totally gone, but the motors smell like ozone. So they're clearly been, they've been stressed on 3S. I think it's, that blaster is going to need a cage. It, it needs a cage and new wheels. And, and the weird part right now with Hyper, we don't know if Hasbro is holding back and they have better stuff later down the road. So if you try to make something now and you start the product of trying to make a blaster, let's say, it'll yeah. take a year and then Hi Hyper might come out with something much better. So it's a little bit we have to wait and see kind of what the environment looks like and when games start. And, and adoption. People. I mean, this we, we were talking about this this week several times, but it's been really hard developing products and designs and things without being going to games. We're a year and a half in now on doing this without going to monthly or, you know, twice. Usually I would play one to two times a month and get to see new blasters. What are people playing with? What do people want? It's a lot different doing that all virtually. <laughs> we had a game last Saturday. Yeah, he got to play. At a 250 <laughs> FPS game. So anything that normally would work out, like, you know, normal Nerf games, <laughs> 250 FPS games is it's a very different environment. Mostly all links, to be honest. <laughs> the links is sweet. Man, Dan, if you're out there, looking forward to talking more on that. Very, very cool. Uh, Shout out to Silver Fox who built my links. It's just beautifully printed, perfect blaster. This is their shirt too, by the way. Um, but uh, they did a really nice job printing the blaster, and I just love it. It's such a good, such a solid blaster. Um, let's see. Let's go to some more design-related questions. We do have Tarek here. Uh, this, they're kind of in, in the same vein. Uh, have you, tr how have you tried to reduce plastic waste from? Uh, 3D printing, and what is your process for designing custom supports? Yeah, that's great. That's a loaded question. <laughs> um, so first of all, everything we design, we either try to minimize the amount of parts or the amount of supports used. Usually supports beat out parts. Uh, if you're wondering why parts is when you have to make such ha mass production, having even one extra part means a lot of extra starts, offering in multiple colors, therefore you need a lot more storage. So it becomes much more complicated. It's a different if you're developing Bowser for yourself versus if you're developing for mass market, it's very different things that you're trying to optimize. And supports is about waste, but it's also about how long it takes to clean up, right? If you're going to make 100 blasters that day, uh, even five minutes of cleanup yeah. is going to cost you, you know, 500 minutes worth of time. So there's a lot of factors into it. So it's literally taking advantage of at day one when we make something, it has to follow those rules right off the bat. So there's some people that design you, you know, you, you like a style, you like a blaster, you design it first and you figure out how to cut it up. We don't work that way. We have to work the other way around. So every part we make has to first be able to be printed without supports if possible. And things like cages you can't get away with no matter how you do it. Um, as for custom supports, there's a couple of rules that we follow uh, from experience. Luke and I have a shared uh, Notion page, which is where we keep all our stuff about like notes of 3D modeling. One advice I can give you is that you want, if you're using 0.2 layer, and this is changes depending on what layer height, which is another thing with different printers you have to worry about, but 0.3 is what we found is the spacing gap yeah. with, between custom. So that's like you've got one layer, and then you that's a custom support piece. Let's say you've got a, a overhang or whatever, and you've got a, a gap between that and the support piece. If you're doing point, it's basically 50% thicker than the layer height, so 0.3. Uh, because sometimes if you just do 0 0.2 or 0 0.25, they'll still adhere and they won't Fuse, pull off yeah. cleanly. And any more than that, you get more drooping. So it's uh, finding that perfect balance. Um, that's what you're aiming for. You're just trying to actually make bridges as much as possible. So for instance, if you have a, uh, let's say you have a one giant ring, one circle and then a smaller circle, you don't need to put supports on the whole thing. All you need is that inner circle because the outer circle I'm assuming is being supported. I'm just letting yeah. make that obvious. And then the inner circle, you just need to support that and bridging. And bridging works as long as, it, most printers, is about 20 millimeters or so. 30 is when you start getting a little bit of droop. And then it's about where can you hide that droop and so forth. So the long and short of it, a lot of testing early on to make sure <laughs> that prints properly way before. And that's sometimes where we get that functional reform fact. Yeah. Sometimes it's just like, well, that looks cool, but it's four more parts, eight more hardware, <laughs> and a lot more support. And we just can't 
And on, you know, on that note, I've been sent 3D printed blasters or printed community stuff where the blaster is amazing, like really cool blaster, but clearly the person, the designer hasn't done any volume of printing because the prints were, you know, a nightmare to clean up. The supports are terrible or they're, you just can't print without two tons of supports and that just isn't really production worthy. It doesn't work. Now that's not to say we are perfect because like Jupiter now is pushing three years old. Yeah. Um, that's three years old and we didn't know we did some support tricks there, but not everything else is perfect. And we would do it totally differently and are doing it differently on the next product iteration that's, well, we've already, that's already public knowledge, more yeah. or less. So Olympus is the next big project. And you'll see like kind of our evolution, Tarek's evolution really with my guidance, but uh, going from Jupiter where Jupiter has a bunch of support that has to be ripped out from the shell parts uh, and custom supports here and there too. but. It's, it's a lot more throwaway parts than we would like. So this next one, it has none, right? Only the cage. Only the cage. So the motor well, there's a little tiny custom support that stops the, where the motor shaft goes through. It supports the inner and then that's bridged from the outer circle to the inner open circle. So that's it. So the entire throwaway component on the entire blaster will be two little tiny, little, you know, gram of, gram of plastic maybe. You know what would be worth showing is the production of Jupiter supports how they changed because we yeah. first had a lot of supports and then the custom supports that we have now are just crazy different and that really was a labor thing so that, that's another we start the goal is zero supports though like if you can do if you can design something to print perfectly without any supports that's ideal and then custom when you when you do need them but then a lot of times supports it really it's not even just the wasted on top of having the wasted material you got the wasted labor so i remember in the beginning on jupiter we just used generic supports on that um on the body, the rail. I should grab the actual blaster because it's, it's on somewhere. The on the ground. On the ground. <laughs> Great place for it. Uh, these supports here initially um, used to be uh, not custom. They were just generic. And we would have to spend probably five minutes per blaster just cleaning up this one part. And then while doing it, you know, you would scratch or scuff parts. So we'd end up with some B-grade parts there that we would, yeah. I wouldn't feel comfortable selling. And so just making the custom part that rips right off was perfect. And then, you know, people have taken this one step farther. We, we really admire the, the links, for instance. The rail on the links um, is printed without support, isn't it? Yeah, it's using, taking advantage of angles. And then the slop is hidden pretty well. So they basically, Dan uh, on the links, Orion Blasters, has which my links is here too. We should just grab that. <laughs> uh, you might have something attached to it. Then it's not. It might have to. something attached to it. That's um. Yeah. That's one way to put it. Yeah, that has something that we shouldn't be. You're gonna have to remove. <laughs> How are you gonna? You're gonna try to hide it? <laughs> I'm gonna try hide it. So, that's so terrible. Um, hopefully, so you can see on this oh. rail. Hopefully. Oh wow, wow! I really did just show that. We just screen. That's okay. Tease, tease is okay. So here on these rails, uh, for instance, these don't have any support at all. They're just a shallow enough of an overhang that they still print. There's a tiny bit of droop, but it's just perfect. Yeah, that was more than I wanted to show. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I know we've been on this question a little bit further, but like even Little Rocket, who does has barely any supports at all, actually. I think it only has one support, which is, again, in the plunger system. That oh, one, yeah. when we did production, was like almost 12 minutes to build the first set. <laughs> yeah. I totally ruined that. Yeah. It's well, okay, it's coming soon. <laughs> it took about 12 minutes, and then we was like making tools and this whole process, and we got it down to less than five to build that same thing. So yeah. it isn't always just about the 3D printing, it's also about the whole process of how you put it together. So we optimize for that too. And that, you're talking about adding like three to five more months of development time just to make it yeah. easier to handle at large scale. Not to compare us with Tesla, obviously, but like Elon Musk always talks about the uh, making the car is easier than making the parts that make the car, you know, the, the assembly. And like we spend just as much time trying to figure out how we're going to produce it, put it together, assemble it, make it efficient um, as we do in the design at times. Because it, like in the case of Little Rocket, there's 200 components. With a, there's all these different color variants. It's several hundred bins worth of, of stuff that have to be organized and the flow has to be good where you go kind of a nice one piece flow from start to end and not waste too much time because if we're making hundreds and hundreds of blasters, uh, a minute a day is, is six hours a year. So if you can save a minute a day, 365 days a year, let's say 360 working days, it's six hours. 
so 10 minutes is 60 hours. And I'm not trying to cut labor, but it's nice to have people work, our team members work on other things that kind of move the needle forward rather than just slogging through some sort of build process that's inefficient because of me not figuring it out or fixing it. Um, let's see. Uh, what is your process for picking the products you want to design? Uh, and do you base it off of a cost versus time or the popularity of a blaster <laughs> or a combination of both? Ooh, you want to do your side and I'll talk about my side? Yeah. You and I have very different design So on my side. side, it always starts with something I'm interested in making. I get my hands on a new blaster and I, that I'm excited about, like genuinely want to play with, and that's what I'm gonna make parts for. Uh, so regardless of whether anybody else wants or needs them. And some people have definitely told me I make stuff that nobody wants. <laughs> and then others, you know, we hit, we hit things like the Percy's Hopper. I got the Percy's and I was like, this is an amazing blaster, it shoots so fast. And it, I hate loading this thing. After like five times of holding my arm out like this with the blaster and trying to neatly load the balls, and I was like, I'm making a hopper for this, forget it. So I made that for myself more than to be a product, and it turned out to be a big seller. Same thing with the Nexus parts. You know, I was super excited about the Nexus, so I made stuff for the Nexus. So for me, it generally starts from something I want to make. I'm not going to make something, I, I don't make anything that I wouldn't use or wouldn't want to make in the first place because it's not, I don't see any fun fun in that, um, which is why at times we won't carry stuff that other shops might have, even though it would probably benefit us to do more. Yeah. Um, and that's where licensing comes in. We're trying to do, we're going to be doing more and more licensing on the shop where those designs that I didn't do or I'm not as passionate about making, but, but somebody else is, like Ton, for instance, he does um, some of our scar barrels and things. Like he's got that figured out, so license it to him, have him do it and kind of go from there. Yeah, for me, it's about solving a problem. So the problem has to be interesting enough to solve. So, you know, when you saw Little Rocket, it was about, I want something that's mountable on your hand that I can put in, and I don't want to spend time, you know, cutting plastic and all that stuff, and I wanted something that's a lot more easier to do it. All, everything I design has to have a, something interesting to solve. So if somebody already solved the problem, unless I think I have a, something to add to it that's a, quite of a leap, then that's when I work on it. So that's why you see me do a lot more larger projects. Though I do have a lot of smaller ones, but um, that come from the same way it says, where it's like, oh, I'm using the MK2, and then I really don't like their you know, holder, so I'll make yeah. redesign it. Or like the funnels that you guys seen already for the Nexus, I'm just like, oh, it's kind of hard to insert the mag, and I really don't like the hole. It leaves when there's no mag, so I wanted to cover it up. Mm -hmm. so, but most of the stuff is I work on larger blasters. And I do ask Luke, because I know you're asking about when do you balance that, I ask Luke, is this a good idea to continue going down this route? <laughs> Um, because it doesn't take me a long time to make a prototype. I'm really fast about making the idea work. That last 10% takes 90% of the time. So if yeah. something is going to turn into a product, we have to be sure we want to go that route. Otherwise, I spend hours and hours of design just you know, tweaking a little bit. And I don't think people realize how much effort we put in in testing stuff. Yeah. Like the Little Rocket, I cannot set 20,000 plus fires that my poor wife had to do. Um, and that's how we know the triggers are comfortable enough because she would have let me know if they're not comfortable since she's the one who has to hit that trigger so often. Um, and that's kind of how we get through that testing. It's not a perfect re replacement for games, which is how we like to do uh, past the performance testing. Yeah. I mean, our old, the old procedure with any product is whatever I happen to be working on that month, I bring to my local game. I bring four or five extras and pass out either yep. prototypes that frequently people get to keep or you know, hand them a blaster that has the part on it that they can test and get real life feedback. That has been challenging this past year. Do we have a uh, admin problem? I see a bunch of deleted. Yeah, you I, got. I, I, I'm trying to. I'm trying to moderate as best as I can, but please I, don't spam. You're just making my job harder to relay questions to them. So, yeah, thanks. Uh, Another design-related question, what product, uh, not the Proton Pack, was hardest to design? And I'll, I'll, mm. I'll extend that to what product that is not the Proton Pack or the Little Rocket is hardest to design? <laughs> that way both of you guys can answer those questions. Ooh. Well, that's a product. That's the, inherently the problem. Because the things that were hard to design, like the shield, just didn't end up being products. <laughs> well, and that's sometimes the hardest designs are the ones that don't don't work um, because 
<laughs> I mean, by default, they're hard because you didn't finish them or we didn't finish them. Um, I, I'd say the last most frustrating engineering challenge or design challenge for me, I don't know. I mean, a lot of the li I've been doing a lot of little things which are a little more rewarding, a little more um, clean cut, things that I know I can get, I can get completed. Uh, switch plates and add-ons and, and grips and uh, battery compartments, things that are relatively straightforward. Um, I did get super annoyed with, this is like a, we have Talon TriMeg clips and Tachi TriMeg clips, and I just got super annoyed not with how to do it, because I, I had, there were, there were several ways you could make the extrusions happen with multiple, um, multiple sketch planes or a single one, but then basically doing it the dumb way in the end. So like you waste all this try time trying to do it perfectly and realize that you can just take the existing, you know, we have the magazine file for the Tachi mags, the 29 round mags. I just ended up in the end taking three of the mags and doing a Boolean operation, which is just a cut. So you take, you subtract the material from the other. And it's like, I tried to recreate, you know, take the sketch, put it on three different planes, spend all this time and get super frustrated and then realize, why didn't I just do this the 10 minute way? I could have had the whole design done in an hour, basically. So that was probably, you know, something more challenging recently. It's just there's a frustration between knowing you can do it one way versus just taking the shortcut. And sometimes I take the long way, and that's probably not the way to do it. For me, it's anything that somebody has to hold in their hand drives me crazy. Like pump grips. Yeah. I have to print so many more extra copies because even though visually it might look right, when you grab it and hold it, and depending on how you hold your grip and how you shift it, it can be very uncomfortable, the mm -hmm. ridges that come up. There is, I'm going to have to be very vague about how I talk about this, but there is a, can I even say this? Yes. There's something I'm working on that requires people have to have contact with normally you would not have contact with. Is that big enough, I think? Yeah. And that's, that's driving me crazy because the entire design now changes from, like I got the prototype, I figured out how the system works and I can't finish it because the whole point of how it's gonna be held is driving me crazy. Yeah. So that's a perfect example. Usually it's when we have to deal with the tactile feedback that that becomes a much more difficult process for me personally. And then ergonomics are weird on their own. Like I, I did a grip for a blaster I never released, and I, I, you know, I made 50 iterations of the grip trying to get it right. And it's good for my hands. It's good for well, most people that have like a medium large hand, but then smaller people, smaller hands don't don't like it as much. And then, you know, it's also a lot of the ergonomic stuff is really personal. How you tend to grip things, how you hold your independent strength, the size of your hands. Um, what kind of work you do with your hands, how how strong your hands are, especially. So it kind of, it, it, it changes. So that can be a pretty frustrating thing to design for, for anybody, I think. Sam, Sam was a nightmare. It still yeah. is a nightmare because that, depending on your forearm placement. Sliding arm mount for those. Yeah. Which is coming still, but. Yeah, you can accidentally hit your arm. There's all these things. And I, at some point I just had to say like, if I keep fiddling with this, I'm just gonna make it worse. <laughs> because then you're just tailoring for other people and you don't know if it's going to work for them. So I have, for instance, I have my wife, I have a bunch of people put it on their hands and test it and see it, but that's just a small sample size. You really don't have yeah. a full, full range and gamut of people's hands for that process. I'm going to grab a question here from the chat or a couple. There's one yeah, from uh, Brandon Roswell. He asked, uh, are you guys planning on doing little rocket adapters for other pro blasters, specifically the Conquest Pro? Uh, I think you can pretty much guarantee we're going to do little rocket adapters for everything possible. Uh, he just fi finished the knockout version. You want to show it? Yeah, grab it. Um, we just did the knockout version, and we just released the one for the um, uh, Nexus, and we should be doing them for most other blasters because it's a relatively obvious design to continue. So this is the same thing. You know, it's got the same tip as the little rocket, but it works with the knockout. So then you can put any ammo type on here you want, which I think is kind of sweet. But yeah, we'll definitely do uh, Conquest Pro unsure whether the muzzle is identical to the other one, but you know, redesigning shouldn't be a problem. So we'll I definitely think do that. The Conquest Pro and the Max Striker are both the same diameter as Nexus and Aeon. Then that should be, I mean, it might even be that the same part works and we'll obviously update listings the second we get our hands on those blasters. Yeah, um, and these are nice because some people that want a pistol version of this, now I can get a pistol version of it that you can use. So you just flop in, put in whatever, it works the same way. It has pretty good performance. 
Uh, but this one was also a pain. I didn't want to talk about it because I don't know if we're going to mention it. But this lineup, apparently there's a variance in manufacturing. So there's this gap here that I've been driving me slowly crazy trying to figure out how to <laughs> properly fasten it. But do we want to show the Nexus version? Because that's hilarious. Oh, yeah. Yeah, grab it. Is it out or do we have it ready? Yeah, we have it. Another obnoxious design was the Nexus top rail. Um, the way the injection mold is, like the rail is slightly off level at the front. It's not perfectly straight because there's mold relief. And then every design, every part of it, because of the um, mold relief the, uh, or uh, draft angles there, it's all slanted. So like, getting that to fit and closing the gaps perfectly is virtually impossible. So yeah, you oh, just yeah. line this up and then you just push it in and now you can fire every type of ammo. The oh, thing yeah. that, fun thing is you can still fire through the middle. Yeah, so if you have it removed, you can still fire through the middle. It doesn't stop you. I made sure that's the case. And then, for whatever reason, if you want to throw a Mega or a Boom core. I feel like more it's like trying to, um, it's like insulting the other person is what you're trying to do. <laughs> like, <laughs> ha ha, I can hit you with a Vortex <laughs> barrel. So. Um, ben Adams asks, how much better is Rival than Hyper on a scale of 1 to 10? I don't know how, what you mean if you want them ranked together, but I'd say hyper, it depends on how you look at it. Like comparing end of life rival to start of life hyper, rival is definitely like five out of five, let's say, and I'd put hyper at three out of five. But maybe given a couple years and you know 30 more blasters, 20 more blasters, we might, it might change. There's no way Hasbro gave us their best three blasters first. Yeah. So, I, I mean, that was the case with Rival when it came out. The worst blasters came first. I don't think the, the SIS series is amazing to start, but at least it's not total garbage. Um, Mach 100 is not really upgradable, moddable in the way that I want it to be, so that's a disappointment. But the Rush 40 with the hop-up tab gets good range, solid performance with a, with a K25 or one of our upcoming springs in it, and like, that's going to be a sick sidearm. 40 shots in your pocket, you know, for a basically Chronos size. So... I mean, that one gets better rating, for sure. To answer that question in a different way, I think that if they develop a clip system for the Hyper, then it's going to be more adaptable for our, for the, you know, the hardcore nerfers. Because if you get a clip system, then you can get some really crazy pistols that have like 30, 40 ammo capacity. But if they keep it to Hopper, I'm not sure. That's a very difficult system to get working without using theirs, like the yeah. conveyor belt or... I'm not sure how else you can do a conveyor belt and there's agitation problems and you can't guarantee that you will always fire. Yeah. So. A little bit of a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, Silly Butts asks, do the, does Auto Darts or the people here help with products or provide any advice over Discord or whatever? I've heard that Luke or, oh, heard of Luke or Out of Darts doing design critique, which would be helpful. Um, we do some of this by email. That's not like a request for everybody to email us. We are talking about um, eventually opening up. Do I want to talk about the website thing? Yes. Yeah, so we're going to, we're probably this year going to start a forum where customers can ask questions, get responses, and then we'll create a master database of knowledge base for the hobby because right now we answer 60 or more emails every single day for customers. You know, a third of those are customer support things for existing products. Others are just advice. What should I build? What parts do I need for this? And there are literally billions of combinations, I, I think, if you were to take our shop and... I mean, flywheel, cage, and blaster alone, there are millions, millions of com combinations. So it's something that I think a forum with more engagement all around would be really helpful. So we're, we're going to try to open that up into a different form that, format. Right now, I don't have the time or bandwidth to manage like an actual Discord channel. Well, Discord also is not very good at uh, retrieving. You can never, you can never find anything. Yeah. And that's, I love Discord. Like the Nerf. Discord is awesome. It's actually really one of the better segments of our community, I think. But finding anything on there after it's been posted is virtually impossible. Um, that was one thing Reddit at least had, is you still get a direct link to the original post is easy to do. But uh, we're going to work on something, because I think it's, it's needed. Oh, yeah, so actually, the other pe most people don't know, but I don't just do the design side. I'm also the website side as oh, well. Oh, yeah. That's I'm a worth computer mentioning. scientist. That's what a, a programmer. So. Yeah, it's kind of the funny things. I have to balance between, because this is, I have a full-time job, Luke has a full-time job, and then when we design, that's going past our full-time job to do our designing. And then I have to then choose between designing or website stuff. So it's always this balance that we have to find out. We're trying to get you as many features as possible. We just didn't stand there. We're two men <laughs> doing, like, <laughs> trying to slot it in as much as possible in our free time. Yeah, and still having to do 
obviously, you know, I'm doing all the bookkeeping, accounting, payroll, managing, training, education, all the other stuff that that's in the business, product sourcing, ordering. YouTube. YouTube. I mean, <laughs> you won't find a lot of e-commerce businesses with a YouTube channel doing what we do. Um, and it's, it's, it's actually frustra incredibly frustrating at times because I love doing YouTube and we love doing videos, but we don't, like I can't put 50 hours a week into the YouTube channel because I don't have 50 hours a week to, to it, there is, aren't 50 hours in my week. Thankfully, we have Perry over here who uh, does editing. He does all the posting, a lot of the like, scheduling and management of the YouTube side of things. So we're, we're improving steadily, and that's the reason this stream looks, like it, looks and sounds like it does too. Um, Nathan Stern asks, uh, when designing a new product, do you primarily focus on reducing c complexity, cost, or time needed to design? Um, we usually, it's following passion first, then it's figuring out is it a product, and then if it is a product, then it's a combination of all, all of the factors. I don't think, I wouldn't say we really f start with anything. I can't say I've ever designed a product thinking about cost from the start. I have stopped designing products that I'm like, this is never going to be sellable. Yeah. I'm just going to make the one-off for myself to play with, and we are never going to be able to sell this. Uh, time for design never comes into play. We'll, because it's, yeah, it's, it's as long as, yeah, it's, it's, if it's passionate, then we do. When, you know, Luke before has asked me to make some things that I didn't want to do, then I think about the time it takes me to design it. But outside of that, uh, normally, no. It's, and that's, that's a new thing with our relationship, too. It's... Um, I ask him if he wants to design something, and if he doesn't want to do it, he just doesn't do it. Um, so he only gets to des design the fun, the things that are challenging to him or are fun for him to build. And design is like, I mean, if you've ever been addicted to a video game, which our audience certainly is, is you know, <laughs> our gamers, designing is just like that. Like that endorphin rush of like solving a problem over and over and making it work, I, it's, it's completely addictive. If I had my, if someone would just pay me salary to sit around and do that all day, I probably would take that job yeah. because I could do I could do 10 hours a day easily yeah. just sitting designing because it's so it's so fun. That and programming for me and I'm set. Programming not so much for me, thanks. <laughs> um, I look at code and get confused very quickly. Um, I know enough HTML to like figure a few things out and I'll dig through the JSON on the our back end, but it's a mess. I shouldn't I try not to touch stuff as much as possible. I yeah. can do a hello world command, that's about it. <laughs> And then when there's something wrong with the website, guess who gets called in and asked questions? Tarek, why is this not working? You're yeah. the viewer. Why is the viewer not working? More, more, than, more than once I've called him, like, kind of panicky <laughs> because I broke something. Yeah. <laughs> We've got a, a question from uh, JoltKing627. Uh, have you considered making a uh, brass, uh, brass breach front end for the Proud Papa? I'm assuming that, like, some sort of locking lug so you could have a brass barrel rather than um, 450 cal darts rather than uh, Do you want to touch on that, on why we have it? Because uh, there is it. <laughs> huh? Do you want to touch on that one or do you want me to? <laughs> well, you can go first. I'll have my um, secondary comment. I mean, the most obvious thing to me is that um, the barrel length of, of Little Rocket isn't, uh, the, the, the air volume, let me step back, the air volume of Little Rocket is so small that a, doing a longer barrel didn't get us much more performance. We tried a sniper barrel, which was brass, and we didn't get the performance gains that we thought were worth having a brass barrel. And then B, for production, it's not as ideal adding in another material that we have to cut, ream, polish, and, and ship. It would add a lot of cost. Um, but I can't remember the exact numbers, but it was really uh, not was, a big gain. It was five FPS gain. So yes, we did test it. And that's from printed. So from printed to to uh, <laughs> brass, 5 FPS, that's pretty bad. Yeah, Because I was like, Tark, make a sniper barrel. I want to, I want to, it's going to be like this long, right? But really, it's about air volume. You've got this tiny little air volume of the little rocket because of its size. The barrel doesn't, the darts weren't, they weren't clearing with enough force. Now, if you doubled the air volume back here, you would change the game completely. Um, like the mistress key, I don't think the specs are that high on that one, but it should be able to fire, well, like it should hit like a caliburn. If you use the caliber plunger, you can get a lot more air volume, yeah. but you also get a lot longer. So that's it's that factor of you know adding 10 millimeters is equivalent to adding 12, 20 millimeters to your blaster length. So, like one thing we didn't talk about too much, but is like little rocket. I was literally shifting two millimeters at a part to see where's that balance of like if I increase the AL volume versus the spring, because there is the limit to how much the spring can help you, no matter how much air volume you gain mm -hmm. in it. 
Um, I was trying to find that balance. So everything there has been uh, tuned to the maximum for that spring and that small area that we had to work with. Now, if we make something larger, that's a different story, and then brass can always can get back into it. Um, there was a comment uh, on the live chat that also was similar to one of our uh, pre-recorded comments, I suppose you could call them. Uh, will there ever be a uh, smart blaster equivalent to, say, the FDL-3? Are you working on a design yourself? Uh, this came from someone who said that they had joined the hobby uh, very recently and FDL is now closed. So. Yeah, we're, um, I'm very interested in making a primary blaster. I'm not going to say any more than that right now. I'm just going to smile. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Yes, so, yeah, yeah, we're interested, for sure. Um, on another blaster question, uh, uh, Luchathor, hey dude, asked about it, whether we were going to make a flywheel or a, a solenoid-powered blaster or a solenoid-fed blaster, I assume is what he means, like the Kestrel. I think uh, maybe. I like, I like solenoids a lot. Um, need to get the cost down on them because a $30 solenoid for, like, the Flywheel of the World solenoids just doesn't, it adds so much cost to a product that if you're also going to have brushless motors, a PCB, battery, it's a lot of a lot of cost, and it pushes that that price point up so high, which is something I'd like to avoid. Um, the market for a four hundred dollar blaster is somewhat limited, I think, unless it's mind blowing. I'm also very interested to see what the Mark III is from Dart Zone because that's going to determine what we do as a company, really. Um, with Dart Zone being on shelves in Target and Walmart, and just being so incredibly uh, open to talking to the community and listening to what we need. They are producing stuff that we just could not touch. So if Dart Zone does it, we won't do it. That's pretty much it. Can't keep up with the production. We're, nev we're never going to make an injection molded Springer. That's basically been set in stone at this point yep. because they've done it so well at such a, such a low price point, we could never, never hope to compete. And for my response to that question, I'm just going to say, keep smiling. That's all I can say. Um, let's see, uh, someone asked if uh, any updates on uh, the Ultra 2 uh, Elite Conversion Kit. Uh, yeah. They, uh, you had kind of teased uh, if there was any interest. Uh, Is it live yet that. is the question. It will be live next week um, because the listing I believe is done. I just needed to f finalize weights and check, double check the pricing and everything and the print times. But yeah, it's, it's coming up. So. It's been, in fact, I think they've started printing. I can't quite see all the 3D printed parts, but they've started printing stuff uh, for production. So it's coming. Yeah, we have a couple new products coming in. It's just been Proton Pack, me getting married, a few other things, just been stalling stuff out. I had so. a baby. Yeah. <laughs> minor <laughs> minor moved, things, you know, just no regular day to day. We, we stuff. moved a nearly 4,000 square foot warehouse. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, been a, it's been a kind of a crazy year. <laughs> uh, let's see. What's the oh. issue with Dart Zone? I'm not able to. Um, do we want to just say someone's asking about Olympus? People know what Olympus is. It's been on a video. So Olymp Olympus is still coming. Um, it is coming this year. It's I don't been we do not have a date. We've done a lot of redesign. He's done a lot yeah, of redesign. Yeah, it's been redesigned. <laughs> um, it's much more interesting and cooler. And the end. Yeah, that's good. That's enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, XY Josh was talking about, do we think the hobby would, be, would grow faster if prices were cheaper? I think you're mistaken in comparing a small boutique 3D printed shop to a retail blaster. Um, but Timmy, for instance, who makes those Kestrels, yes, they might be $300 assembled, but they take several hours to build. There's about 40 hours of printing. There's all the equipment required to do all of that. There's a $30 solenoid, flywheels, motors. It's a lot of components. Um, it's not like he's making $100 an hour putting those together. Uh, I would, you know, it would be a tough living to just build Kestrels and sell those exclusively as a, as a, as a full-time job. That would be, would be difficult, even at $300. So I, I just, you really can't compare injection molded product where they make a million of them, sometimes literally a million. Yeah. But certainly Hasbro doesn't make anything that they're selling less than hundred thousand, hundreds of thousands. Um, you just can't compare the economy of scale of that to 
someone making parts out of their garage or even us here, uh, they're never going never gonna to compete on the same way. Um, but the thing that, that you're really missing there, I think, is get a printer yourself and start printing uh, links, print, print, buy files, buy a hardware kit. There's so much you can get right now. Um, obviously not our stuff because we've kept things closed source for a variety of reasons, but uh, there are lots of things that are free online for parts or cheap for, for you know, you buy a hardware kit for a, a Caliburn or a Talonclaw, and you can make those very inexpensively if you're doing getting the parts yourself and printing yourself. That's the way to go if you want it to be. Well, even the kits are cheaper than probably finding sourcing each part individually. Yeah, they are. Kits are sure. like 50, 60 bucks. Because you have to buy on. volume to get those kits down, down in price. That's, a, that's for the more like maker, maker feel, maker people. I think the, the thing that's going to grow the hobby, you're, you're going to get it already, it's Dart Zone. Dart Zone's got 10 blasters coming out, they claim, this year. Um, and they're probably all going to be spectacular because that's just what Dart Zone does. Well, and they've been also uh, leaning in on short darts, which yeah, is... Yeah, which is also awesome because it's all we want. <laughs> um, Fake Name asks, how have the Prusa Minis been working so far? <laughs> <laughs> and what type of problems have you encountered with them? What type have we uh, not encountered is the right question. Can I? I can't roam with any of these cameras, can I? Shoot, I should have uh, set that up. It's I, okay. I, uh, I would make, I was, if I could roam with the camera right now, we're not set up for a wireless. Um, it's not worth the effort. It's sure. not worth the effort. Uh, um, I, would, I, would take, I would take the roaming camera. Wait, does that work? Uh, it should work. Uh, you'd, uh, What's that we app? Can try that. <laughs> uh, EpoCam, I believe Epo it's Cam. called. EpoCam. Let's see if it hooks up. Um, maybe give us another question, and we're going to come back to this Prusa Mini question, and then, I, and then we can do something fun. Uh, so I can answer this partially. He used to have 41 Minis. I used to have 41 Minis, yep. Now he doesn't, and I'm stuck with a Mini, and that's how that turned into it. Because one thing that's another thing is that whatever printer he gets, I also have to get because I have to test all the production first to make sure it works before I even send it to him, the files. So he bought 41 minis. I ended up getting a mini. Mine didn't work for six months straight. I had to send it back to them. They managed to fix it. They sent it back to me, and it prints. But if you do the wizard check, it fails the wizard check. And they're so confused by it, they're asking me to resend my printer back to them so they can figure out why mine's unique in that case. Any luck with that, Perry? Yes. Wow, that's awesome. So, so here, let's I'm gonna wait. I want a little behind the scenes here. This is Perry. For those who haven't met, sorry, Hello. I just forced you to be on camera. Oh, uh, <laughs> here, let me actually put my mic on. I should also be careful where I'm pointing the camera. Should yes. I? <laughs> Try not to spoil everything. You know, I'd say Hi. that people don't pause it and screenshot it, but they definitely do. So Perry's got his sweet set of streaming set up here. He's running. Um, you know, our, we've got three cameras here set up. Now four. Now four, but the wireless. Um, so the thing I was gonna say is that if I go down to the printers. We put stairs in, which was kind of nice, I have to say. And see, Tarek, the thing but is... But if I go down to room. Printer oh, yeah. Alley, you will not find a Prusa Mini in this farm. Oh. And uh, we're gonna, there's a lot more to come on that as far as uh, story. But uh, uh, we're going to be on uh, 3D Printing Nerd in one of their upcoming videos. Joel just visited us. And we are now exclusively a Mark III print farm. I got rid of all of the Minis, so there were 41 of them. They're all gone. I won't go into detail on the issues and why, but suffice it to say, they didn't work well in our environment here and the paces that we're gonna put them through. And at some point when you've wasted too much time on fixing, repairing, trying to get reliable prints, uh, you've wasted more time than the cost difference between a $1,000 you know, a printer, a $900 printer, and a $450 printer. So yeah, no more, no more minis at this, at this point. I love that that works, that we can wander around. Yeah. That's, that's pretty fun. I should I point out that uh, Prusa paid for everything. They send me new parts. They pay for all the parts and all that stuff. So you want to swap us back to At yeah, least from that standpoint, it was good. But the fact that the minis, uh, from my experience, is all hit and miss. Either you get a really good mini and it works perfectly fine and you don't have to do anything, or you get a mini that's just temperamental and you have no idea why. Yeah. And they don't know why because I went through six months of back and forth with them. I've had replaced like a third of, of my printer and they couldn't figure out what was happening. So Bruce has taken care of us too, I will say, but it's been a long, it was a long road, a year, a year plus in trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, we also have a, a video review of the Mark III printer is one of the ne next couple videos. So sometime in the next month, we'll, the video will come up that's our, basically like our million hour review of, 
of a Mark III, which I think is hopefully insightful for those who um, are considering getting one or you know, whatever, are interested or other farm operators. Hmm. Okay, let's see. Um, Nathan Stern asks, any plans on uh, uh, SLS? I'm assuming the resin printers, right? Yeah, um, probably not. Um, uh, SLS is uh, centered, layer centering. Oh, why can't I remember the acronym? Doesn't matter. It's a, a laser that cures cures a powder. That's actually different than resin. Um, the cost on the printers is pretty substantial, and everything we do now. Um, I'm looking at the wrong camera. <laughs> oh <laughs> no! We, yeah, sorry. We're, we're oh, on another camera. Let me go back. That's kind of fun having multiple. I like it. Um, the we always have to look at you know the return on investment on equipment. As much as I want toys, I do have a, a resin printer we're going to play around with for scar barrels because there's. A real advent. There's a benefit to it. Huge benefit there with the small layer height and just the lack of the, those discernible layers. Um, but SLS printers can run, you know, for something that's production worthy, 10, 10 grand. Uh, you start running the economics of how many prints and parts you'd have to sell off the SLS stuff. And I mean, don't get me wrong, SLS is like the best you can possibly get. It's what uh, it's what most companies are using to prototype uh, injection molded shells because it can do really clean, really clean printing. Um, I know Drac did play around with an SLS printer for some part. I can't remember what he was printing though. Selective laser sintering is I what I knew there was saying. sintering is the last word. <laughs> that was the only one. Um, but yeah, it's essentially a powder where you've got, I think it's two lasers or, I, I don't know the exact tech, tech on it, but where they intersect, it cures, cures the powder or, or hardens the powder. Yeah. Um, it, from what I've seen though, uh, a bit like metal printing, the cost of the printers for our market is too much to sell the parts because if an FDM printer can print a part that costs, let's say $6, right? This, this piece of plastic we print, that printer costs $1,000. So breaking even on this is going to be a lot faster than if the print costs $10,000, it means a part like this might have to cost $60. Assuming they can pr produce the same amount of parts per day, per hour, per year, at the same um, filament cost, filament cost, which is also higher yeah. on SLS for sure. So yeah, some of the things just don't work. Um, CNC is obviously something I'm interested in. Haven't had the time to really dive in and learn and get educated. So we might work with shops instead. But maybe someday SLS play. But I don't. I don't see it being production. I don't know any case study of someone using it for production. And there has to be a reason. So with with resin, the reason why we'd go for that is that layer height. You might be able to get better barrels there printed or. Um, yeah, that lower layer height. But yeah, it has to have a specific benefit that gives us that we cannot gain from our current methods. Yeah. Uh, or we can't design around, which is the other aspect that we do a lot, is we just design around those uh, limitations. Great question from Michael Jordan here. Hey, Michael, I know you've watched uh, other videos of ours too. Um, how do you re rediscover motivation when it dies in the middle of a project? That is an awesome question because it happens to both of us frequently. Mm -hmm. um, Mine used to be just set it aside and work on something new and then go play Nerf. But that kind of went away this last year and a half. So like that reset part of like go get inspired and see what other people are doing and play is gone right now, which is hard. Um, so for me, it's just about like work on something else, set the project aside and come back to it. Sometimes it's just abandon it, honestly. If you're not feeling a project, in my situation, I've got hundreds of ideas and projects, maybe a thousand different ideas that could be, be something and never enough time to do them all. So I can always just shift gears, work on something else. And if I feel the passion to come back and try to figure it out, I do. What about you? Uh, two, two different way methods. Uh, one thing I do is never take the fun out of the project, which is you do only the fun aspects first and then you're stuck with like styling. That's the last thing you have to do and you don't want to do it. That's yep. my, my kind of, I suck at styling. And uh, that'll be said in the video too <laughs> that we recorded yesterday. Um, so it's just about make sure you balance it out. You do the aspects that are fun and you do the aspects that are not fun, but you spread it out so that way you're not stuck with only the not fun parts. And for everybody, it's different. For me, like I can't style to save my life. That's why my wife helps me. That's the other way to do it is get somebody else to do the tasks you don't yeah. like doing. My wife is pretty good at uh, drawing, so. I like her doing. And the other way is what he's talking about, which is called a slow burn, is you do multiple projects and you 
touch a little bit of them at a time and you swap through and you never burn out. The, that effect of losing passion comes from doing something that you don't want to do it for a period of time, a long period of time. And that's yeah. where you need to keep swapping to prevent that from happening. There's also that, we talked. you talked earlier about that 10%, 5, uh, 10%, 90%. Uh, I even think it's worse than that. It's like the last 5% of a project takes 95% of the time. I mean, that's where, that's the number I feel. And so that last 5% is where it's really easy to get stuck. Um, and sometimes it's just about working longer and faster on the same project to get through those hurdles quicker. But it happens to everybody, for sure. And it really depends on how you're doing it too. So if you're going to make a blaster, you're going to open source it, your problems are going to be different, right? We, in here, because we keep everything in house, we have to make sure that when it comes out that door, it is the best possible. Yeah. We don't have somebody else, um, you know, can help us fix that mistake. If Because open source, the nice thing about open source is that you don't have to finish the project. You can be like, you know what, I don't want to do these last parts. Somebody else will fix my problem for me. And that kind of mentality. I'm not saying it's in our hobby. I'm just saying in general how it is on Thingiverse. You see a lot of these, they're not even done developments of things. like. Yeah, and we were talking about yesterday about our frustration with Thingiverse. Uh, both Tarek and I, we're not, you know, professional designers by any means. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm nowhere near a master. You know, mastery of anything takes something like 10,000 hours, it's frequently said. And, like, I, I feel like I was approaching filmmaking master after 13 years of working in that industry. Um, and, you know, sort of mastering the tra craft and trade. But we're not there yet. Um, I'm totally distracting myself yeah, by reading. But, but, no, it's, it's like um, we're not... I'm trying to think of how I'm actually what I'm trying to say. <laughs> my brains. <laughs> I'm a little sleep deprived, guys. Um, also, my back. Le hurt my back lifting my daughter, and it's like a constant nagging, nagging thing now. Um, <laughs> what just okay, what are you trying to say here? And I'll help him out because <laughs> I had you. this conversation. Is a lot of stuff we find on Thingiverse, we have to redesign constantly. So even I'm not oh, we're yeah, not talking yeah. about the Nerf hobby. We're just talking about it in general. Like, oh, I get I want to get a tripod for my camera. I get that, and I see yeah. there's so many flaws with it. And then it ends up being that I just have to redesign the entire thing. So like, the only thing that benefits me at least tells me some dimensions. It gives me kind of an idea of what I want to do. But outside of that, I have to remake almost everything that we see. And this there. and it kind of happens over and over. Like I'll print some little house trinket. And I'm like, oh, just print it and it's good. And then none of the tolerances are right. And we know our printers are pretty dialed in. So either the person who designed it designed on a different printer that the tolerances were different or out of spec. And, or, or something just doesn't work. And you're like, that's a terrible design. And you end up taking the 15 minutes to do a quick, quick you know, design and, and fix. So yeah, it's kind of, it's, it's tough. But you know, it's different when we're designing our own things and releasing our own, our own stuff and kind of controlling it end to end. Uh, where is it? Uh, doc, uh, PR dot proton pack uh, <laughs> uh, asks: Did you buy the Dart Zone Spectrum, and if so, what's your rating on it? I think that was before we started doing the, the little rating system on our blasters. Uh, yeah, I would give. Um, I can I can answer that one real easy though. The um, the Spectrum in stock configuration. See, this is like <sighs> grab it. Um, I'll give it four stars. And the only reason I give it four stars is I don't love the styling and I don't love the grip. Um, I feel like both the grip and the styling and, and the kind of the cheaper plastic feel to it aren't as solid as the Strife. The Strife grip is more comfortable. The blaster is a little bit more compact. Um, and obviously, you know, we're working on a kit too to remove this, this nose. I'm going to call it the nose job because <laughs> this is such a weird muzzle. Um, yeah. But I think this is a tremendous value, and it is a better performing blaster than the Strife. So overall, I'd give it four stars. Like if the ergonomic and kind of quality of, uh, of feel was higher, it would be a five-star product because out of the box, it performs the best of any flywheel blaster I've ever tested. I cannot wait. Again, I've said this like three times in the stream already. I can't wait to see the pro version of this because that's what's coming. We're, we're, we're just two weeks from knowing what pro version of, of this is going to look like, and I... I expect them to knock it out of the park. Uh, this is a good, actually, on this topic. This muzzle, I don't, none of us are designing it. It was somebody else, right? We we're just licensing this? Yeah, muscle? that's a license. Yeah, so this is a perfect example of me and Luke are don't really good at styling, so it didn't make sense for us to design something like this to work out. And I could have done, I mean, I could do this and I would copy and get it the feel I want, but someone else had already done it, so licensing just makes more sense in that. There are so many projects that we can't possibly, even if we were both working full time, we would still never get them all done, yeah. so. Um, 
yeah, I give it four out of five. Um, I will do a mod guide on this. I've got the parts. I just want to test a few more things first. Um, I, I still think this is going to be a relevant blaster for a while, a while to come because stripes are kind of hard to find now. I, I, I went to try buy a couple and there weren't any anywhere that I saw. So it seems like we're kind of moving on to more used stuff on, in the strife world, I suppose. Um, Peter Schwenkel, I apologize if I uh, pronounced your name wrong, asks, how much lean manufacturing mentality have you integrated Ooh. into your business? So if I had my way, oh, I should pre preface that by lean manufacturing is just the comp concept of, of simplif simplifying. And we look at it as three, uh, sweep, store, sort, and standardize. It's just about making, simplifying everything that you do, making everything really obvious and creating systems. And we are trying to do that across the entire business. The problem is, is it takes a lot of time to implement systems. So we're getting better and better. Um, we really have been working on one piece flow for all of our, our uh, buildable blasters and orders where you kind of go through, you grab the one thing, you pretty much never set anything down and you go through the assembly process in the most logical way. We had Tarek design the order sheets to line up perfectly with that, uh, with that flow so that it, it's identical. We're, we made documents for every single part that we sell on how to prep it, what hardware goes with it, and that sits up on the wall of the um, of the uh, design area. We ought to do another video eventually of more warehouse improvements. I guess we do one every year or something. Yeah. But we're still working on it. I love New York CNC. That channel's amazing. Um, but yeah, lean is something I, I would like to implement more and more. It's kind of about focus. I never have, there's always too many things to do. So it's, it's uh, um, One more part to it. Even in the design, we take yeah. lean in yep. manufacturing. So when I'm making parts and I'm deciding parts, we're talking about it, we're minimizing the parts, using as much of the same hardware. This is one of those big differences between open source and uh, not open source. Just, how do I say this politely? It's not incentivized for somebody that's open sourcing a blaster or selling kit to make the hardware easy to acquire. Yeah. Because it hurts your business. Uh, but for us, we want to minimize as many hardware as possible. So we want as many standardized screws as possible because then you can buy a large bulk save cost yeah. and translate that to you guys as well. Um, so I got a little bit distracted there. But yeah, so, so when, when we, like I said, that's the aspect of support because part of lean manufacturing is that, you know, the person assembling doesn't have to spend any time cleaning the parts. So that's one aspect. The other part is each place, and you saw the little rocket, um, has like a little area that works on and you follow that process. And then when we did that and I was remote working, he would do a camera, he would wear a camera on his head and he would go through the process and I would make comments as to changes and he would tell me what comments are like, oh, I need you to change this part, yep. make this part easier. It took too long to put the square nut in, we need to change the tolerance. And it's tiny little changes because we knew we were going to sell hundreds and hundreds of those blasters. So it's literally, like we were doing time trials. We were starting a timer, wearing a GoPro, recording the thing and then Tarek would look at where are we getting held up, what can we fix, what jigs or tools do we need to make. Um, yeah, so we're, re we're really still working on that. It just, it, it's like lean is like a way of life. It's a constant, constant improvement battle and you have to make the time to do it for sure. And if we don't, we won't be able to have room for other products. So it's kind of a balance effect. Um, let's see, here's some random. Timothy uh, Wen asks, does the Tachi cup Tachi Tri-Mag coupler work with the extension, uh, extender, uh, mag extenders? That yeah. is a good question. It will, but the, um, you'll have to shift. Oh, I don't have the right one in front of me. So this is the Talon version. The Talon version is like more of a rectangle, whereas the Tachi has the ribs, sort of the Magpole style ribs. Um, it's intended to go on the top junction, but you would need to put it one, uh, is that right? I'm going to have to check on this and, and report back on compatibility. Um, I'm literally making myself a note to confirm because I'm actually not sure. Um, I haven't tried it yet. And if it doesn't, I'll make another version that is. <laughs> because it would, it's, it's a very simple change for me to make. I'm literally adding this to my, to my list. Um, does it fit? Do you have another question while he's working on it? Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, awesome guy number 10 asks, what happened to the full auto Hera? Oh, so I did a, we did a mod fail video on that, which you can find on the channel. Just type in Hera on, the, on our channel, right? Was yeah. that with you? Mod fail Hera. Mod that, fail Hera. That was uh, probably in 2019. So that was yeah. before I was yeah, around. Yeah, it, it was a bit ago. But um, essentially, with the amount of space there was to put a gear motor in there and the size that the sprocket, the actual pusher, needed to be, there wasn't enough torque to get any decent rate of fire out of, out of that blaster. 
There are probably other approaches, but in order to do it, it would have required gutting the interior, lots of shell cutting, and it just wasn't worth it for more than a proof of concept. Like, I'm, again, it's one of those things, I very, it became clear it wasn't a product. It was just for me. It was like a fun thing to do, and, and I, had a, I had a blast like trying to make that work. Um, I do really like the Hera too, so it's, it's kind of sad that it didn't, didn't work as well as I wanted. Um, so, someone asked, and it reminded me of another question, um, someone asked uh, what the best value short dart blaster is out there right now, or in your opinion anyway. Um, primary, Nexus Pro, or yeah. probably the uh, uh, Striker, Mac Striker rather. Mm -hmm. uh, or if you really want value, I mean the $25 Aeon Pro, man, it's hard to beat, right? Yeah. yeah. And people have you know, still made pump kits for the Aeon Pro, <laughs> yeah. which honestly I don't necessarily get, but you, you know, know, teach their own. I think the only reason to put a pump kit on the Aeon Pro is that the Aeon Pro has more potential to mod because it's got a larger plunger tube. The air volume is almost 50% larger than the sure. Nexus. So technically, if you got everything set up right, you could probably get it shooting hotter. Um, that said, people just like to mod. We're printing one of those, uh, a really nice looking pump kit for the Aeon Pro. That's a good example of another um, person approached me about designing and licensing, and it's a really, really beautifully put together kit, mm -hmm. but it's not sellable. It would just be too expensive. It's, uh, you know, too many pieces, too many pieces, too much hardware, and just too much plastic to, to possibly make it a, I mean, it would cost three times, four times the blaster, <laughs> which to me doesn't seem doable. Um, have you ever modded a Nerf Alien Menace incisor? I have not, and it's kind of a funky blaster, which is probably why. Um, I've is got it a picture. That one just behind you? No, okay. I don't have the incisor. It's from the same series. Um, no, I have not modded, modded that blaster. Uh, it's certainly possible, but no, unfortunately, there are hundreds of blasters I still haven't modded. It's hard to keep track of. With the releases now, I'm really not getting through the back catalog anymore. Like if it's five years old, three years old, I can hardly keep up with the new ones because we've got multiple third-party companies really killing it. Yeah, and so many different variants of the same thing. Like workers adding that new blaster too. Yeah, the Swift. Yeah. Yeah, we got the Swift. Kind of an interesting blaster. I, um, I think it's gonna be fairly popular, but it definitely needs some tuning out of the box. Um, Silly Butts mentions, uh, you mentioned making a wall knowledge base type for the website. Oh, talk to Phone Blast about theirs. Yeah, I'll, I'll, um, I'll talk to them as well. We've got our, you know, obviously we've got our agenda too because it is our, you know, our business. We want to build and support people, but maybe we could do that collaborative, collaboratively with someone else. Not, not totally sure. It'll kind of depend on what people are doing. Um, ultimately, we have to be responsible for any content that's up there, and so it's got to be moderated very well, regardless of what, what we do. Yeah. Moderation is just key. Uh, not seeing very many questions on chat right now. Let's go back to some of the... Uh, Out of dart. Bray. Hey, oh. Bray. Oh, hello. Bray asks, do I like hot dogs? Oh, man. <laughs> that video is... If anybody hasn't seen his video, yeah. you've all seen it. We all... Yes. Anybody that's subscribed to, to me is subscribed to Brett. I, rather, I take that back. Anybody that actually mods and is in our hobby is probably already subscribed to both of us, we've realized. Oh. Brett is killing it, by the way. So if you're not um, subscribed, you really should, because he just passed 50,000 in like a heartbeat, which is awesome. Yeah, he actually, for he got the YouTube on the rise. Creator on the rise. Creator yeah. on the rise thing for 24 hours. He was on, on the trending page, so. Congrats to Brett. By the way, that video was hilarious oh, with the hot dog. Oh, so good. I, he, made, he made me look like a, like a jerk, though. Hey, Luke, get I was doing shot. all that when we were cleaning up to go, and he was still filming. <laughs> we're, like, packing up. I'm emptying the squirt guns that we were playing with. <laughs> I, th I think that's his goal. Was, yes, oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know Brett's ways. <laughs> oh, Silverbox is here. Hey, dude. Or uh, probably probably both, uh, both of you, I suppose. Odin likes hot dogs. Yeah, he Sure does. <laughs> Odin, yeah. Odin's going on a diet, I hear. Yeah, poor it's in the Odin. comment section on oh, the bottom. Oh, poor Odin. But it's good, it's good for him. He'll be around longer if he goes on a diet. <laughs> Rexter Waffle says, what is the best Springer out 
right now. I'm looking for another blaster. Um, if you're willing to build or buy a Talonclaw, not a Talonclaw. I like Talonclaws too. Sorry, Lynx. it's my second. Lynx. Lynx is my favorite Springer right now, period, of any type. Um, that's no, you know, I like the Talonclaw too. That's probably number two on 3D printed. And we made it slightly better. <laughs> And you spoiled it already. Yeah, that's all right. But the Lynx is awesome, and um, Silver Fox does a really nice job with the Lynx. Really beautiful printing, and, and definitely go check out the site. We'll have a video on that coming up. I'm not. Our schedule keeps changing, but in the next month we have a, we shot our talent. To our uh, I keep doing it. The Lynx review, mm -hmm. but uh, sh uh, spoiler alert: five out of five. It's just spectacular design, really well put together. Um, so that would be the way I would. That's the one I would get 3D printing. If you're going to get one that's a off the shelf, I'd say go check, either grab the uh, Nexus Pro or the Max Striker, depending on your aesthetic preference. I haven't had the Max Striker in hand, but judging by the reviews so far and the fact that the internals are pretty much the same, it's a win. Uh, do you have any plans or uh, major additions, upgrades, variants, etc., for? the Jupiter or the Proton Pack? Upgrades for the Jupiter or the Proton Pack. So we have another blaster coming, uh, Mount Olympus, which will come out this year. We talked about it a little bit earlier, but uh, that'll work with the Proton Pack, which is not really an upgrade, but it's a different way. There'll be some upgrades, but some feature upgrades especially, and performance, and yeah, a lot of things. So yeah. let's, we'll, I'll stop there, but it's a mountable one. So right off the bat, it's like you can have your Proton Pack. You can have your cake and eat it too. You can have a Lynx throw your proton pack blaster on top and have everything. You get the range and the, the hose dump. <laughs> yeah, the mow Flamethrower. <laughs> the proton pack is a flamethrower. That's really what I've come to realize. Like that's effectively what, how you should think about it. Yeah. You can't, you can't compete with someone shooting 200, 250 FPS from a range, a distance, unless you can close that gap and get around. At which point you can eliminate whole crowds. Yeah. Or, you know, HVZ where they come to you. My favorite way to HBC, play. HBC, where the targets come to you. I, there's nothing better than, than End War. I mean, I, I must have eliminated 300 Zeds, 400. Shot a lot of rounds. I mean, sometimes it's hard to tell who's getting what, but it, it's like an arcade game. <laughs> oh, here's, a, here's another one that might uh, allow you to walk around a bit if you'd like. Someone uh, asked, can you talk a little bit about that magnet setting jig for the Percy's Hopper Lids? Yes. Do you know which one he's talking about? The, yeah, the, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, grab it. Do you, do you mind grabbing it? Oh, or, hey, sure. Diego, could you bring me the Percy's install jig? It should be in the middle there. Uh -oh. uh, I'll grab it. Sorry, you know where it is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about that quick. That's kind of a fun, um, that's like one of those things. It's like fixing a design problem. I love that stuff. Grab a lid and a ring too, Perry. <laughs> Making him run down. Grab a lid and ring. Ah, okay. No, there's a... Um, Silly Butts is asking, are, am I aware of Taffy's skewer design? I'm not. I have not seen a straight pullback on a talon claw. Cool, I'll have to take a look at that. I'll ask Silver Fox next time I see him how that, what, what that is. There are a lot of blasters. We have an internal blaster tracking database, and it's, it's hard to even keep up on the 3D printed stuff, because I think there's probably a hundred new ones a year now in yeah. the community. And you, you can't tell if those are just one-offs, if they're just gonna make a couple, or they're gonna make a large, so that makes the difference. Sweet, yeah, this is kind of a fun, hopefully there's some magnets where I'm gonna have to make Yeah, them. they're right there. There are a couple. So this I is. I feel sorry for him, he had to run up there. And <laughs> this is, I don't know if we can see this very well. Here, I'm gonna, let's see if I can slide this in. You gonna do this backwards? That'd be impressive. Yeah. It's the only way to show it, right? Yeah, Luke, you can do it. I'll just watch from a safe distance where my fingers are not going to get no, cut. No, no, it's, it's easy. I think so. That's oh, that's great. So essentially, we've got a lid and a ring that need, Ooh. oh, that was fun, um, that need, uh, they need, they each get a magnet glued in, and it's a tight fit so that they'll stay in. We glue them as well, but each side of this um, holds, holds the magnet just perfectly, or holds the part exactly where it needs to be. And then it's polarized. There are magnets that hold on the bottom. A little hard to explain, but essentially there's a little auger that takes this magnet and pushes the magnet down. That magnet flips out the bottom and connects to a magnet that is embedded in the bottom. And then it lets you, um, so you'll see I can't put this in 
it's actually sticking. It's coming back out, so it can only go in one way. And then you've got the part. So when you when I release up, you'll hear a little click, or I'll break everything. What is going on? Oh, that would be hilarious. It's used hundreds of times and it's not working on when I want to do a demo. I can't see what I'm doing. Hang on. <laughs> I don't think you just didn't lift it high enough. If you uh, unlock your phone, I might be able to use your phone and you might get a better angle. Or there might be something wrong with it. No one's told me that. Let's see if I can pull it off to actually show. No, I can't. How did it? Oh, I made that magnetic too. It's been a little bit. This is going to be easier to show. So essentially, there's little fingers. These two little fingers push the magnets through, the magnets enter through the side. There's a slot in the bottom where the magnets come out for on each side. And then right next to that slot, there's a polarized, um, or rather, it's magnetized in the right orientation for the part. So when, when that auger pushes this down, it pushes the magnet up and through the, the inside. And clearly something is, oh, maybe the magnet's got glue on it. Well, it'd be nice if it worked on camera. Let me try the other side. Parts like this frequently get reprinted too, so it might be that this is due for a cleanup. Because um, I can see some glue gunk. I think something got in here a little bit and we're having some actual issues. Let me just make sure. This happens in the programming. Anytime you have to show off code, it never works when, <laughs> when you have to demonstrate to so, anybody else. I'm not sure how well you can see this on camera, but essentially in the bottom, that part goes completely flush. So then the magnet flops there and then you push it down and it should install the part perfectly. But right now it does not want to push up. So I think what's happened is we probably got some glue gunk or something that's stopping us from, uh, from being able to do this. But essentially each side's got the same thing, but they're, they're mirror images of each other, ensuring that every lid and ring that goes out of here has the same orientation. So if we ever have to replace one, we don't have to send them a set. We can just send them a single one and the magnet will be in the right um, polarity. I'm a little disappointed this isn't letting me do how it's supposed to work though. I think it needs to be reprinted. That's sad. But that wouldn't be the end of the world. I mean, it, it's seen a lot of, <laughs> it's probably done a thousand units or something. <laughs> I mean, with these kind of jigs, the whole point is that we can just easily print them out again and. I mean, that's the best part. It's like, this is a dollar worth of plastic to, to, solve, a, to solve a problem. Um, but this is a, actually a good note for next meeting is to find out who didn't tell me this was broken. <laughs> Because it looks like it is actually legitimately busted at the moment. I think you put on the sleeve first. I think I can get... Yeah, you're probably right. I hear that a lot. I also think it might be backwards. <laughs> anyway, um, that's, hopefully that's, that's an approximation of how that works. I wish it was working so I could show. But normally on the upstroke, the magnets click into place. And then on the downstroke, they go into, into your actual part. And you did it again. Let me do it. I think we do have uh, B. I'm, I'm muted. I think we do have uh, B roll in the top ten lean warehouse improvements. Uh, that should be more clear. So if uh, after the stream you want to, how does this work? See a little bit more. Got to remove this first. Specifics. You might be able to. And then put that on first. It's this. Is that what I'm doing? Yeah. It's wondering. so funny. Like I can't remember. Oh yeah, that makes more sense. Uh, do you have another question? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, let's see. <laughs> while, while we watch him while, struggle, yeah. while Luke struggles. And now that's going on the list to, to oh reprint boy. today. Um, and adding to list. This is, make, this is every day here. There's always something to do and, and, and uh, uh, deal with. Are you considering making an adapter for the proton pack that hooks to the purses, Percy's extended hopper door? No. Um, and the reason is, so if we take a Percy's... Nope, that's got something we don't want to show on it too. Never mind. Um, Percy's hopper, right? This is the this is the door. So he's asking, can we put an adapter here? Um, the way my proton pack works is it's really intended to be a feed for your blaster. Um, if you just jam balls into the hopper, you're you're literally going to jam the hopper. Um, you would have to have like a a manual. Oh, that's a good thing to bring over. You'd have to have a manual. Um, button where you're essentially just refilling and then in my opinion you're kind of losing the best factor of the proton pack which is the absurdly high rate of fire uh, my proton pack can feed 20 rounds a second if you put the 20 rounds a second into um, the percy's hopper then it's only going to fire at that inconsistent percy's fire rate versus 
this clunky, kind of clunky looking adapter, this will shoot the 20 rounds a second, which to me I think is more interesting. Now you can dial that down with a PWM too. Um, I don't have a PWM on this one, but I have another no. one that does. Um, so I feel like the Proton Pack is better as a filling, uh, a direct feed device rather than filling a hopper because I don't know how you would do it with this. You would just have to have a button that you occasionally fill and then continue shooting and then occasionally fill. Because if anybody's used one of the hoppers or any rival hopper blaster, you can't just jam it full of balls. It won't feed. They'll get, if you overfill it, um, the hopper, for instance, can hold 160. That's the recommended load. You can put almost 200 in there, but if you put 200 in there, it's definitely not going to feed. I mean, and you want as least amount of parts between where you're feeding into the motors as possible. So you're just adding more complexity for no reason. I mean, it's the same thing like why Jupiter has a like, little thumb thing. That's it. There's no complex way yep. of getting the ammo in because that's just another thing it that can fail. It didn't need it. Yeah. Uh, Peter uh, it says, don't worry about the last name. It's hard. Uh, and are you planning on licensing and or selling the Holster Gecko Plate that was uh, attached to your gecko in the review. That is a good question. I don't know if Edrian made that. I assume that's Edrian. It, it, well, it yeah. was yeah, printed by C. Art Nerf, but probably an Edrian I, design. I assume it's his. I'll, um, I will reach out because we should carry it. Uh, we are going to do more uh, magnetic mount stuff. Uh, we were just t talking about that a little bit yesterday, but we're going to do more at some point because we want to make sure we are supporting all the new blasters that are coming out. And um, yeah. So we'll probably, we should be able to offer that. I'll probably just license that rather than redesigning it and, and taking it. But it doesn't need a design tweak. Yeah. Because you you have it, you didn't put it together, I did. And it's a little bit finicky. So that's kind of the thing that always happens. Yeah. Uh, any more ideas for uh, proton pack adapters? Someone specifically asked about the charger. The charger. So yeah, in fact, I got something cool I can show you that's just like my work in progress, if I can find it. Oh, I always do this. <laughs> we are still working hard to get everything organized up in this um, studio. There's also the monolith that I just saw a 30 second clip for. Oh, the, the new one. Yeah. The dart zone uh, slash adventure force. Yeah. Monolith. It's like uh, Percy's esque, right? Yes, that's exactly what it is. Uh, I don't, yeah, I'm failing I show and tell, you guys. <laughs> um. Which one are you looking for? I'm looking for the, ch the uh, charger. I think it's on the wall. No. Wait, is it? That would be really dumb. Unless you've been modding it recently. I was working on it. Now I... Terrible. Oh, bummer. Okay, so... I'm gonna have, just going to have to describe because I don't have... I mean, there's an, a new one up top, but that's not helpful. Um, so the issue with the charger for a proton pack adapter is that you can't, I, no matter what I've tried, I cannot get the balls to go into the top, even with cutting and just getting it to go down into the top and then flow into the feed system wasn't working. So for my personal one, I attached a tube to the bottom, did a whole mess of cutting and routed up from the bottom, which is much more comfortable for the charger since it's that P90 style look. Um, but it's not going to be, there's nothing to sell or, or give anybody really because it's just not i mean i wish it would work that way but it, the best solution is really like do it the hard way it's it's cut cut and um you know maybe use one of our glue on attachments is what i did to to wire it up but essentially it was just impossible to make the turns and curves and it was going to require a massive amount of cutting and reworking and it just didn't seem worth it to offer now on the zeus i've got the zeus adapter done but the problem is the pack feeds so fast at 20 rounds a second or even faster at the first, the, the first balls that go through are more like 35 rounds a second because they're in the tube. It actually will fry the Zeus's flywheels because the Zeus just has a flapper gate. So if you're gonna do semi-automatic, it would be totally fine. But if I sell it to someone as it is now, even though I put all this design time into it, it would, um, it would basically fry the motors because it's pushing too many wheels through the motors at one, or too many balls, balls. through the motors at once. Um, so what it needs is a firing circuit, an electronic trigger, and a pusher wheel like Jupiter, basically. Yeah. Because otherwise... At that I, point, you're replacing most everything. I just don't like, sell, I don't like selling things to people with high risk of them destroying their, their toy. And that's what that would do. It did d destroy one of my Zeus's because 35 rounds a second is like mm -hmm. enough that the wheels can't catch up and eventually they just catch a ball and stop. 
which is unfortunate. Uh, Fender Mustang 65 asks, oh, I am muted. Lovely. Fender Mustang 65 right. asks, is there any updated info on End War? I'm assuming they mean End War 2022 because 2021 yeah, has 2021 been was canceled, is canceled. So if that's what you were, and, and, Rag and Rag 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 Ragnarok, awesome. all the big events are canceled except for um, Jared's Epic, Jared Battle? What is it called Jared now? Jared Epic Blaster Battle. Jared's Epic Blaster Battle. Yeah, that. Jeb, for sure. On Rag, because I am, well, I don't even know what my role is. It doesn't matter. Involved. I'm involved in uh, TSD, uh, and so that's uh, the Stalking Dead variant. That's the three three way team. So player versus player versus player versus zombies for Rag. Next year, because we have all this time to back up uh, people that came out last year, you know, we had like eight nine different missions that you can do while in the game, and it's pushing closer to thirty now. So there's going to be a <laughs> lot more interesting things coming up for that one. That's going to be fun. I can't wait. I'm going to make every single event next year that I possibly can. I, it's such a void of, of being able to actually play with our toys. I, I miss it. Uh, CR Nerf asks about any update on the battery for the Proton Pack availability. Um, I've got them on order, but the process with getting batteries custom made for the shop or custom manufactured, is, it's months. It's three months to get them, so it's, a, it's unfortunately a little bit. Um, any plans for a Proton Pack adapter for the Nemesis? Awesome Guy 10 asks. Um, I'm working on one, but it's just massive, and I'm trying to figure out a more advantageous way to do it. It's the same problem where I don't want to just feed the hopper because it'll just jam up. It's got to feed the bottom of the feed system. It's got to get into that into that actual, um, what would you call that, like a, the, the rolling, the final little alley alleyway that they, the balls get into to be fed. Um, so it's got to do that rather than just feeding the hopper. So it ends up being a little bit more of a complex design because it has to take up the space of this massive hopper. Um, so, oh, uh, this is a good question because it's kind of a failed mod slash I went down a rabbit hole. Best Kid asks, what about the Dominator if we're asking about proton pack adapters? Um, well, you know what he's referring to, right? Yeah. So the Dominator, when I got it, I immediately saw that it was large enough to shove a rival because it's a 40 round, it fits a 40 round dual stack, double stack mag. So it's large enough to shove a rival mag well in it. So I did a proof of concept, Ooh. which was basically an adapter to brushless wheels, br brushless wheels and um, turn it into a rival blaster. And it ended up being like so much cutting, wiring and everything was involved. I was like, you know what, forget this. I'll just make my own blaster. So I made my own blaster, then realized that the blaster I designed was never going to be production worthy. And I kind of lost interest. The project was called Athena. It's sitting at home on my desk as a reminder of a project I want to get back to. I still would like to do a primary proton pack blaster. That, that's all it does is just shoots like really high power. Uh, but I'll, so I may revisit that. But at, at this point, my design skills have gotten better since I did that. I spent like two years on it. And then I, I basically would have to start over. So I, I probably I won't definitely won't offer like a dominator kit, but that would make a really good failed mod video. Yeah. Because it's working well enough to fire it. Mm -hmm. So we should definitely get that on the video list just to show where that went. It's, and a, it's a similar question to uh, some people have asked about uh, Juno, the stock configuration yeah. for Jupiter and where that went. And that we didn't do a failed mod on that, did we? I nope. don't think we have. Well, we should do that. So that's two failed mod series we should add because I think those are interesting. Um, as much as I hate uh, failing, failing is a huge part of learning, uh, both in business. I've made more mistakes than I care to admit, but uh, if you learn from them, then they're valuable. As long as they don't sink you. <laughs> yes, well, there's that. Uh, um, do you have a favorite shell ejecting blaster? That Shellington blaster that Coop just reviewed, <laughs> I haven't seen it in person, but it looks amazing. I, I might have to... Oh, I might have to order one. Oh, the, the Flypoint? It's a Flypoint, sorry. Is, it, what, is Shellington a different Sh blaster? Shellington is the name, Flypoint is the blaster itself. Shellington is the name of the user? Yes. Okay, I, I, haven't, met, I haven't met the designer, so I, um, yeah, Flypoint. That, <laughs> that blaster looks amazing. Um, I'm very curious how the mechanical system works. I'm going to have to just get one, huh? Because it seems like it's a very delicate system, and it that feed mechanism, but it seemed to have worked out fine. Though that you need two fingers to pull on the trigger tells you it's probably mostly mechanical. Yeah. Mechanical it's, it's leverage. It's pretty neat. Um, the only other one I've really played with is the um, Spring Thunder, 
which the initial one jammed my pinky really bad and I kind of have a bad taste in my mouth because of it. <laughs> I have like this nasty uh, blood blister on my finger because the grip is like not big enough for a hand so it's sandwiched right, right at the base of the pump. But uh, yeah, that one looks, fly point looks sweet. Uh, second wind uh, technically also has ejection. Oh, that's true. Yeah. yeah. The mags fly out. I haven't got to doing, um, I've got it, but I haven't done, uh, I haven't done the video yet. I mean, there was a comment I saw that like critiquing other people's designs. That could be fun. Yeah, but we would have to get permission. We don't want to just rag on somebody. Mm. Depends on, yeah, it depends on whether it's like lighthearted or. I mean, if anything is Brett designed, I have no problem ragging on him. So, Brett, you can send me your stuff. In. <laughs> I should just react to Brett's videos. <laughs> we still want to do a, like an Out of Darts reacts. We do have a couple, yeah, we have a couple ideas for some reaction videos that I think are actually going to be worthwhile. It's mostly commenting and reacting to videos that aren't in our hobby. So, Nerf related videos that aren't directly part of our community. Because I think that would, yeah. be, would be kind of interesting. And there's some good content, so we might get some crossover there where we find new people actually find our hobby. Because the worst thing is, and this is one of the videos we'll probably do, but like Adam Savage does this amazing, you know, Nerf mod or whatever, and then doesn't mention the fact that there's, there are hundreds of thousands of people doing Nerf mods and it's like a pretty growing hobby. It's like we would have loved that one line of like, people are doing this, not you could do it too, not just I made this, watch me. Love Adam Savage though, but. He's always in his own little world. That's the thing with him. Brett says, Im yeah. LOL, imagine me designing something. Check me. <laughs> <laughs> what if that was, what if we made him design something? No, he doesn't, you have to have enough. He did design, so you guys, he did design something. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, 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 yes. The Jolt minigun. This. <laughs> we can, we peak, can. Peak innovation. Here, let me get on the close-up. I mean, the more I look at it, it's, the harder time I have to say anything, <laughs> anything at all. You know what? Now that we've done this, I'm going to do a short where we shoot really nice B-roll of this piece of... <laughs> <laughs> amazing, ma amazing design and work. Uh, I carefully set it down on the ground. More, more the list on the list of... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, More on the list of B-roll that I'll need to shoot at some point. Yeah. <laughs> Oh boy, we're coming at that one hour and a half mark. So yeah, Th I think we'll we'll take like it. two more questions. I do see awesome guys saying Luke, you could just replace the Nemesis door and then have a feed tube lead to the flywheels. Um, no, because you the tube has to get down in there perfectly and get right into the channel. It can't, and it has to block off the top so they don't pop back out of the channel, and kind of bypass that the actual um, reverse auger that's inside there. It's, um, if it was simple, it would already be done. Let's just say that, because I did, I did the simple ones already. Uh, here's one from the uh, uh, comment section, I believe, of Instagram or whatever. Uh, do you have any ideas uh, to, to allow to dual wield Springer pistols like uh, the Dark Zone Mark II that you could like Ooh. prime off of it, your I waist mean, or something? You could do a, what, like a... Well, Captain Slug got the strap stuff that you put on your Yeah, you could do that with a, something connected to the top slide. Like if you made a part that glued onto the top slide and had a ring, so you could like connect it off of your neck or, or your, your rig. It would have to be specifically designed for that. That's the only way I think you would make it work. Because it would be really s s difficult. Well, no. No, actually not. Because some things, you know, you, we've seen people put T loops on a lot of stuff. Yeah. And to help with the priming, then you can just put a hole in there and then you can hook up, you know, one point sling and then you could use the technique. It'd be pretty dur durable. I don't know that, like, you'd get the six shots and then you'd have to reload anyway, so you'd be setting one down. Hey, but you're already Joel's attached. Here. Joel's here. 3D printing nerd. Hey! How you doing, Joel? Joel just came here and played around the warehouse, which is pretty sweet. He brought some electric skateboards, which I thankfully did not injure myself, but I went around the warehouse a couple times around the outside. Nice. They are really fun. And that one went way, could go way too fast. He had it on like uh, baby out of darts mode to go only 13 miles an hour. <laughs> but it was, uh, it was fun. Uh, I snowboarded for so many years. So like those boards feel natural and unnatural at the same time, but super fun. 3D printing nerd is definitely one of my favorite uh, 
probably my favorite uh, actual maker channel. Uh, I saw another question we should answer. What was it here? Oh, Beskid asks, do you think 3D printed blasters will ever be as durable as injection molds? Um, that is 100% depend dependent on the material you print in. Now, we print PLA because it's both the least toxic thing we can print when we're printing indoors and enclosed spaces where we have to breathe it. Um, it also gives off no odor, yep. and it's um, relatively environmentally friendly on a long time scale compared to uh, most others. But it's still not, you know, it's not directly compostable. Uh, we, people ask about, in fact, I just answered an email this morning about... Petchy? About, well, just durability of, of PLA and stuff. And we've sold tens of thousands, tens and tens of thousands of prints. And the number of people we've had actually melt or warp something is infinitesimally small. LiPo batteries require the same heat resistance. So on the heat side, you really shouldn't have your, your blaster. Your LiPo shouldn't be in a hot car. So you might as well grab your LiPo and your Jupiter or your LiPo and your blaster. So that's been our approach. But as far as durability, we've got that uh, polycarb blend from Prusa. PC blend, yeah. PC blend, it is insanely strong. It's stronger than, prints from that are stronger than any piece of injection mold you've probably ever used, unless it was po also polycarb. Because most injection molded uh, blasters are, of course, ABS. So that's gonna be your most common. Also, fun fact, that changes how you develop, because normally you, you, you take advantage of the fact that PLA allows a little bit of like flexing. Mm -hmm. And so certain like holes you're made, you actually make them smaller than normal for PLA so that when then you put it on an object, it like spins. You cannot do that with a PC blend. There is no flex. So actually dialing the right size holes becomes a lot more difficult than it does for PLA. And then for us, you know, from a, like if you're printing at home, do whatever you want. You could go crazy with the materials, but uh, PLA is just consistent. It's reliable. It prints well. And we already have 23 colors. I don't really want to have to deal with the supply chain of twice as many to offer two different filament um, types. So that's kind of our, been our thing. But you can certainly make durable stuff if you really wanted to. Um, ben, ben M says, do you think there will ever be a SLA printing in your industry? Um, there is already. Uh, at Worker specifically, they already do a bunch of SLA yep. prints. However, uh, Joel and I have been talking about maybe doing something uh, SLA related. He'll have more on that on his video on the 3D printing nerd. But uh, I think we're going to try, try something because he's got a bunch of SLA printers and we can play around and see what we can make out of resin for, for Nerf and what, whether it makes sense. It'll be a kind of cool exploration of that. Um, I think that about wraps up today, guys. Uh, yeah. We are plenty more to do here at the shop. Um, hopefully we got to most of the questions, but uh, if you're, there's any others that come up, uh, leave them in the comments and we will uh, definitely try to add them to future lists. Uh, please don't scrub back to the video and see things you're not supposed to see. <laughs> oh, they'll do that. I know. That's but you know what? Um, it was already seen at the game. Someone sent me a screenshot of, oh, of a photo of, oh. from the game the other weekend. Um, it's always funny when we have products, we have to test them and then people see them and kind of word gets up before we want it to, but Surprise! Apple, Apple has that problem too, right? Yeah. yeah. doesn't matter who you are. <laughs> um, thank you everybody for tuning in. We like doing these streams and I thought it was fun to do one while we have Tarek here. Um, we'll probably do another one next time you're down too, a couple mm -hmm. months maybe. Uh, lots more to come in the shop and we are retooling the channel a little bit. We're going to try to do less reviews, do more original content and more mod guides and maybe more behind the scenes stuff. So uh, we'll have some Q, uh, some questions coming up on YouTube, like polls, as far as the, what people would like to see. If you see them, and you're one of the people that's here watching this, or you're watching this on replay, answer those polls, because they're going to influence the future of what we make and what the content we create. Um, and that reminds me of somebody's question of like, how do we get more people into the hobby? It's making these mod guides. It's not about getting a 3D printed blaster for somebody that first joins. It's about buying a $20 strife and modifying and yeah. getting the experience of changing that strife to be as competitive as your more yeah. high-end blasters or the 3D printed one. That is th the hobby. Definitely. You need to introduce people into the, let them have fun making stuff, and then you, you know, do these customized 3D printed blasters and so forth. Completely agree. Thank you again, everybody. Until next time, uh, I'm Luke without a darts, and I'm, I'm out of darts.